It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ulrihi Gollant. Uh, he's currently a professor in the Technical University of München. And he uh, received his PhD in uh, Heidelberg, University of Heidelberg, 1998. And then he did the postdoc in the Karlsruhe and CTBP in San Diego, which I was, uh, I also did the postdoc there. But I, do, I didn't have overlap with uh, uh, Uli. Uh, I mean, I just get, uh, went there like 2006, he left in 2003, so <laughs> I didn't have overlap. But I, I knew that uh, Uli was around with uh, Terry Hua. And then he actually, 2003, he uh, become a group leader in the Germany, LMU München. And then he, uh, 2006, he become an assistant associate professor in the University of Cologne. And he moved to, uh, I mean, again, he moved to Arnold Sommerfeld Center for the Theoretical Physics in 2008. And then since 2014, he's a full professor in the uh, TUM, Technical University of München in Germany. So he is going to talk about some uh, issue of fidelity in the uh, copying information from DNA to RNA and things like that uh, today. So it's kind of maybe similar to what uh, Pierre Gaspar talked about. So, okay, let's welcome the speaker. And then I have uh, some one suggestion because uh, uh, this is what uh, speaker asked. So, if you are uh, having any um, uh, questions, um, just feel free to uh, interrupt him so he can actually, he wants to be more interactive than just to speaking to the world, <laughs> okay? Okay, let's welcome the speaker. So thanks a lot for this uh, very kind introduction. Um, it's my pleasure to, to join you here in this, in this format of, of KIAS. Uh, and uh, yeah, let me start sharing my, my screen. Um, Hope you hope you can all see this. Yes. Yeah, in my pointer. Um, yeah. So, so you're right. I mean, so the the topic uh, that I chose for this talk um, is is sort of related uh, to what, what um, Pierre Gaspar also talked about. Uh, so it has to do with with polymerization. Yeah. So polymers that contain information. Um, and I want to focus in particular in, in the sort of main content part of the talk on the issue of accuracy in, in copying, yeah? because that, that is quite important to maintain information. Um, and, and also on the role of uh, uh, physics, in particular sort of non-equilibrium environments and interaction of the environments with this process. Uh, and what this role could be for the fidelity of copying. So I, so, but what I did is basically for this uh, lecture, which I suppose is um, meant to be more sort of broad and pedagogical, um, is I sort of added a longer introduction, um, which is really just conceptual, yeah? So not a whole lot of uh, information, but, but uh, sort of focusing on, on, on concepts. Yeah, I want to start with something that you're all familiar with. Yeah, we all know about evolution, uh, Darwinian evolution. Yeah, I, I like to sometimes think of it as, as, the, as the engine yeah, that's running on our planet, which generates most of the complexity that we see or with Hatch generated, uh, most of the complexity that we see um, around us. Yeah, and, and as you know, sort of, uh, this this engine basically so the cycle that it's running consists of these three major steps yeah that you have replication of uh, uh, genomic information and uh, then there's mutation some some variations generated and uh, out of that variation you there's selection uh, which involves the environment and competition with organisms and so on. Um, and this sort of uh, feeds back onto the replication process. So now, of course, um, I should be a bit cautious here. Yeah, so a caveat, of course, not all of the complexity that we see around us is due to Darwinian evolution. Just pure chemistry by itself, for example, uh, can generate lots of complexity already. Uh, but um, uh, I think we all agree that biological complexity by far sort of exceeds anything uh, that we know from the 
science of non-living uh, matter. Yeah? So um, the question, there are a lot of sort of big conceptual questions about evolution, yeah? and, and each of them is being investigated still yeah, as we speak. So it's not sort of an, I mean, it's an old topic, but it's, it's, a, it's a very sort of uh, up-to-date uh, topic still. Yeah? Uh, for example, uh, people like to would like to really understand how evolution generates innovation. How does it come up with novel um, concepts, novel solutions to problems? How is, um, I mean, in the sense that you have the concept of survival of the fittest, yeah, you would think, well, maybe just one species on earth would uh, survive, but really we see, uh, fortunately, still quite a bit of biodiversity. Yeah? How is that maintained? That's a big question. People, also physicists, yeah, uh, are trying to understand whether we can predict evolution to some degree. I mean, of course, it's stochastic because um, uh, the mutation part is, is stochastic, but uh, still, as you know from research on stochastic processes, uh, uh, there can be some sort of uh, uh, clear predictions about stochastic processes. Yeah? And, and then the follow-up question that people are uh, interested in is how could you perhaps control uh, evolution to direct it in uh, in directions that are interesting for medicine or other um, so things that are important for mankind yeah but but that those are not the questions that we want to uh, focus on here so the the, the question that um, we want to focus on or the whole field of sort of uh, physics of the uh, emergence of life uh, focuses on is how to get that engine started. Yeah? Um, so basically, I mean, once there was the concept of Darwinian evolution and you had the first cells and first organisms that replicated itself, you could imagine, okay, it runs and it sort of generates higher and higher organisms. Yeah? But how, how could this process have gotten started? Yeah? So this is sort of uh, still uh, mostly not understood. And um, so the, the picture, the idea that that field, I mean, that science has about this, I mean, is that it could have gotten started in something that is referred to as the RNA world. You know? It's a hypothesis and it's not the only scenario, but kind of the idea is that you have um, molecules, yeah, as depicted here in, in sort of the ocean, uh, and they perform some sort of um, interactions, chemistry, uh, and they are exposed to a violent kind of non-equilibrium uh, environment. And due to the interaction between uh, the molecules with its environment, um, there is some emergent process that, uh, that creates sort of the first replication uh, scenario that uh, has sort of a molecular evolution process where you have replication of informational polymers. Yeah, so polymers that contain sort of information sequences. And this um, is maintained that information, but also varied by mutation and somehow it generates more and more complexity. And yeah? that's sort of the, the idea. And I'm not sure how much you know about this. I mean, um, so I, I have a couple slides just to introduce the concept of the RNA world. And, and yeah, as, uh, as was said, uh, please interrupt me at any point. Um, so, so basically the RNA world is, is, as I said, a hypothesis. And there's two important things that, that you should all, I mean, that everybody should know about. One is that this hypothesis is really motivated by um, a dilemma, a kind of hen egg dilemma uh, that you have in early, early evolution, and I'll explain that. Um, so that's sort of a theoretical kind of motivation for the RNA world uh, as a resolution of a, of a paradox. Um, and, and there's also some, some clues um, for that suggest that, that we have, that there was at some point an RNA world uh, on the early Earth. Um, from just looking at sort of the modern day biology, uh, 
Um, and I will just mention one, one of those clues um, in, in, in a bit. Yeah? So let's, let's maybe just quickly talk about this hen and egg dilemma in early evolution. Um, so, so, I mean, you all know sort of this, this um, hen egg paradox. Yeah. So what came first, the hen or uh, the egg? I mean, you, you need a hen to make an egg, but then uh, you need an egg to generate a hen. Yeah. So that, that's sort of the, uh, the basic paradox. Um, in the context of uh, early evolution, this paradox is um, formulated usually at, as in the question, um, what came first, the protein uh, or the gene? Yeah? So the protein is like the hen and the gene is like the egg. I mean, uh, you, you need proteins uh, to synthesize basically in modern day biology, uh, DNA and, and genes. Yeah, so you have uh, DNA polymerase and so on. Um, and then, of course, uh, you need genes in order to make the proteins. Yeah? So um, there seems to be a dilemma. Of course, I mean, this paradox, like all paradoxes, uh, basically, uh, is just a paradox because the question itself is ill-posed. Yeah? I mean, so the, uh, the, the likely answer to these kinds of questions is that uh, none of them came first. Yeah? It's basically they emerged at the same time. Yeah? So, so for, the, for the hen and the egg, it's, it's clear that they originated in some, I mean, long time ago in some single-celled organism, and that single-celled organism replicated by, for example, like budding yeast does these days, uh, just budding off a small part of itself, and that becomes then a new cell later on grows to a new cell. Yeah? So this is sort of a, a growth mode and, and sort of gradually this evolves over many, many intermediate steps um, into something like uh, the modern day hen uh, and the modern day eggs. Uh, so, so, what, so how can this work with molecules? Yeah? Uh, so, so the um, the interesting thing about proteins is that they have these um, a capability to, to catalyze um, enzymatic, uh, so, so catalyze chemical reactions and proteins uh, act as uh, enzymes. So, uh, and, and, and then the genes, DNA, uh, encodes genetic information. And, and the resolution that the RNA world offers to this paradox is that RNA can actually do both. It can encode information and it can also catalyze um, biochemical reactions. Yeah? So um, an important clue for that, that, that this sort of, that RNA could have been perhaps the first catalyst uh, uh, that was in an evolving system um, is, um, uh, well, actually, so uh, I, I just I noticed, so I, I inserted this slide because I, I uh, um, wasn't sure if everybody knows what, what RNA actually is, uh, just biochemically. Yeah, so um, I, I just, um, uh, this is just an old uh, teaching slide, sorry for the bad resolution, it's a different format, but um, uh, did just to remind uh, all of us and put put us on the same page, yeah. So we have uh, the double-stranded DNA helix that you're all familiar with, which basically is two polymers uh, that are bound to each other in a non-covalent way. Yeah. So they uh, so we have uh, many monomers uh, along each strand that are uh, covalently bound here to this sugar phosphate backbone. And then there is a sort of non-covalent interaction between these two polymer strands uh, through um, hydrogen bonds and, and other sort of non-covalent interactions. And, and RNA is something very similar to DNA. Yeah? So an RNA strand uh, basically um, just has a slightly different uh, um, side chains, these bases. Uh, so uh, uh, in particular, uh, the T base uh, that exists for DNA is replaced in RNA by a uracil, uh, a U base, uh, which has very similar chemical properties. It's just a little bit um, more, uh, less discriminating in its um, uh, base pairing uh, because uh, uracil also likes to pair not only with its uh, cognate um, partner A, but uh, also a little bit with the G. I mean, uh, 
T also binds with uh, 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 DNA G, but not as well as, as U does with G. Um, and then there is a chemical difference in the, in the backbone, uh, which is basically the, this, this covalent chain of bonds along the, um, along the strand of the polymer. Um, so there you have uh, a ribose uh, uh, sugar for RNA and a deoxyribose. And the, the main difference really that, that matters uh, in the end is that uh, the RNA backbone is a little bit less stable. Yeah? So, so what happens is that this RNA backbone can be attacked, for example, by water molecules, uh, and this is called hydrolysis. Um, and and uh, so the attack of the water molecules can cut the polymer at any position uh, into two pieces, for example. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is just sort of a, a, a RNA 101 primer here. Yeah? Um, so, so let's just get back. Yeah. So the clues from the modern day world uh, that uh, the RNA world may have really existed. It's not just a, a crazy idea. Um, I mean, there are many such clues, but maybe the strongest one, which is uh, sometimes called the smoking gun uh, of the RNA world, um, is that the ribosome, which I think you know is the, the enzyme uh, complex that makes uh, proteins. Um, this consists of both RNA and, and proteins, and this was long known, of course, um, but what was discovered only sort of about 20 years ago um, is that the RNA components in that protein RNA complex, they are actually the ones that catalyze the peptide bond, yeah? so the bond between uh, the amino acids um, that uh, is made when uh, a protein is synthesized. Yeah, so, and, and that, uh, that led also, it was part of the reason why uh, this new term was introduced, which is called ribozyme. Yeah? Ribozyme is basically an enzyme that is made out of RNA. Okay, so, so this, and since the ribosome actually is one of the most conserved and oldest kind of uh, molecules in, in, in life. Like if you compare all organisms to each other, uh, the ribosome is something that is extremely conserved between all of life. Yeah? So, so, the, uh, so the thought is that this ancient molecule complex, uh, since that already had RNA as the main cat catalyst, uh, probably RNA was the first biocatalyst. Yeah? That's, being debated, but that's sort of the idea. So there are many, many open questions. I mean, uh, do you have any, any questions uh, so far? If, if you do, always uh, just interrupt me. Can I add something? Sorry. Yes. So in the RNA world hypothesis, are the uh, ribonucleotides assumed to be just naturally abundant? Ah, yeah, they are, yeah. And, and we'll, I have one slide about that. Yeah, so we'll get to that briefly. Yeah, but they are assumed to be uh, abundant, and how that came to be is actually one of the questions. Yeah, and and you're completely right. And this is actually in. So I I, I took this image here from a nice review by Paul Higgs and Niles uh, Lehman, uh, cited below here, and they sort of listed. Uh, many of the puzzle pieces that, that need to be worked on and that are being worked on uh, in different areas of science in order to puzzle together basically the, uh, the RNA world. Yeah? And, and what you uh, just asked, uh, a great question, yeah, is, is basically what's shown here in box A on the top left, namely how can nucleotides be synthesized in appreciable quantities? Yeah? Because that is a prerequisite uh, for this RNA world. Yeah? Um, and, and let's maybe focus on, on that box. And actually, all I ever will talk about in this talk only touches upon this box A and the box B. Yeah? So the first two boxes, that, that is basically our main uh, topic here for today. So, so about this uh, nucleotide, um, uh, ribonucleotide synthesis, yeah? so this um, has received a lot of attention by, by very uh, sort of well-known chemists. And one of them is, uh, uh, one or uh, three of these are Matt Pauner and, and Beatrice uh, Gerland and uh, John Sutherland. Yeah? 
and and and, and Matt and and John they they uh, continue working uh, on on the chemistry and uh, of um, generating uh, RNA nucleotides and also um, sometimes uh, at the same time um, amino acids. Yeah, so it's not clear whether RNA was there in isolation in the beginning or whether sort of amino acids and RNA and, and the small peptides, they all came together. Yeah, so the, the big trend uh, that has emerged over the past maybe 15 years or so is called systems chemistry. So to not look at isolated reactions so much anymore, but really look at networks of reactions and how they, how they can produce um, uh, the, the, the molecules that are needed to, to generate life. Yeah? And, um, and this is just one sort of uh, hallmark paper out of many uh, this was in, in, uh, published in Nature about 12 years ago, um, and, and they uh, reported sort of a pathway to get some of the ribonucleotides under very natural conditions that are sort of very plausible uh, from the starting material that you had on early Earth and, and the kind of uh, environmental conditions. Huh? So, so we kind of uh, regard that as a solved problem. Uh, even though it's not, yeah? I mean, people are still working on this, and, and the big challenge is to to um, find conditions and natural reactions that uh, do all of the synthesis in the, in the under the same conditions and uh, as a downhill process and so on. Yeah? Um, but let's briefly maybe talk about the next step, which is um, if you have individual ribonucleotides. You need to also generate longer polymers of RNA you know, because uh, longer polymers are what is actually needed then in order to generate the first catalytic molecules. Yeah, so this is also a process that has been studied a lot, and I just want to give you a little teaser because this is not the uh, the main topic of of uh, this talk, um, and because we've recently uh, uh, worked on this. Um, so the, the, here's kind of a, a sketch of uh, sort of perhaps the increase of complexity and, and sort of different processes that may have um, arisen during um, prebiotic evolution. Yeah, so you have some primordial chemistry, which is uh, sort of, which generates the, the, the monomers uh, and then uh, random polymerization of just basically monomers sort of uh, adding on, uh, ligating, polymerizing to longer polymers. Uh, that is a process that is well characterized in chemistry. It typically leads to length distributions uh, that, is, that are exponential. Yeah, so you have an exponentially small probability to find a long polymer. And of course, what matters there is sort of the decay constant of the, of the exponential. And it's uh, generally, found that this decay constant is actually quite quick, yeah, so that the polymerization process would um, end at very short um, polymers typically. Yeah? So one of the questions is how can you generate uh, long enough polymer strands in order to have material to work with uh, uh, for prebiotic evolution? Yeah? And, and one of the ideas uh, that is around is that actually um, it's not just polymerization, random polymerization that generates longer uh, strands of RNA, but that they can, just like the DNA double helix, right? They can, they can hybridize to each other if there's some sequence recognition. And if you have a, 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 um, a, a complex uh, where you have one, let's say, so-called template strand, and you have two other strands that are bound to it, uh, then this can lead to uh, the ligation of these um, two smaller strands. Yeah? So, so basically what we have there is sketched in the, in the, uh, in the bottom right here. So you have the binding um, of the consecutive binding of two smaller strands to a, a longer strand. And then if they are adjacent, this catalyzes then the template strand basically catalyzes the ligation with a certain rate um of of these two smaller units yeah? and if you now um think of a soup of molecules uh 
which is in some spot, uh, some reaction vessel, which of course in nature would be maybe some small uh, liquid um, uh, 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 volume. Um, and there's some constant sort of um, non-equilibrium environment in the sense that there's always injection of small molecules that are generated by this prebiotic chemistry. But then you also have uh, leakage yeah, due to diffusive loss or maybe convective loss, uh, all kinds of sort of loss mechanisms that there are in these violent non-equilibrium environments. And then you ask, well, what's actually going on? Yeah? If you do not just have simple random polymerization, but you have um, uh, these sort of binding events, uh, which can lead to complexes of uh, two, three or more uh, strands that are uh, non-covalently bound to each other, what actually happens? Huh? And, and you this- probably, So you are yes. not actually also, uh, considering the effect of a polymerase, like RNA polymerase here, it's just a random- no. uh, Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's no sort of catalytic enzyme or something here. It's just spontaneous sort of, um, uh, and also there's no energy involved in that sense, yeah? but there's still non-equilibrium. I mean, and, and, and these, uh, maybe there's some energy in the sense that um, uh, the, the short pieces here, they need to be chemically activated typically yeah, so that they can actually form this bond. And the activation is lost in the process of forming the covalent bond between two single strands. Huh? But yeah, but otherwise, uh, yeah, there's no enzymatic catalysis here at all. Okay, so th there's another question from in the chat box. Uh, yeah. the, the question is about the stability of RNA when it's a form of complex. I mean, so you are talking about the lo long uh, RNA polymer production, but uh, he's asking uh, when it form a complex, maybe RNA can be more stable. That's what he said. That's, that's, uh, that's uh, very true, actually. Yes, uh, that's, a, that's a good comment. Uh, um, so I, I mentioned this hydrolysis process, which can cut uh, an RNA single strand. Um, and if you have a double-stranded RNA, it's somewhat protected. Yeah? Uh, I mean, so the, it can still be hydrolyzed, uh, hydrolyzed. So it can still be cut, but the rate is slower. Yeah? So yeah. So it's more stable. Um, and, and these things, of course, they depend a lot on the conditions. Yeah? So there's uh, hydrolysis is strongly temperature dependent, strongly dependent on pH uh, and, uh, um, and so on. Yeah? But what I briefly want to mention here is, is, uh, is just a sort of an interesting observation that we made. Uh, uh, so we, we think that's interesting. Uh, so if you basically look at, so we modeled uh, sort of such a container um, where a reaction volume, where these things happen. Yeah? So basically just spontaneous binding, spontaneous unbinding, and, uh, and a templated ligation process, which is a, a really a, um, a covalent and um, sort of irreversible reaction here. Uh, and then you have non-equilibrium in the sense that you have influx of small units and you have outflux of everything, dilution. Yeah? And then uh, as a function of this outflux rate, yeah, so is what you see here is the length distribution of strands that are contained in such a reaction volume. So uh, the length distribution uh, basically shows what's the concentration of a certain strand length and it's at high outflux rates, very high rates basically, you get an exponential distribution. And this looks uh, here a bit strange because it's a, it's a log log plot. Um, uh, but, but what happens, and this was already known, is if, if basically uh, you can have um, a, a stretched uh, behavior, like, a, like a, a, a fat tail power law distribution uh, that emerges when there's some growth mode uh, for polymers. Um, and the growth mode is basically, uh, uh, shown here, yeah, so you can always have uh, um, template-directed uh, polymerization, and then you can have uh, addition of another one, and, and this can sort of grow, grow in a staggered manner to even longer polymers. But what emerges uh, when you reduce the outflux huh, or increase the influx, uh, no, no, actually you need to reduce the outflux, sorry, um, then um, 
you get sort of all of a sudden a peak, a local peak in this length distribution. Now, which is, which is interesting because uh, this peak defines a preferred length scale. Right? It def defines a dominant sort of uh, length that emerges uh, just out of these non-equilibrium uh, conditions. And this length scale is related to a kinetic competition between different uh, processes that occur in this reaction volume. So it's, re, uh, it's uh, determined by the uh, competition of the unbinding with uh, the outflux and also with the effective extension rates. Um, and, uh, and these two scales that are shown here basically all emerge from this competition. Yeah? So this is something that I don't want to dwell on. I don't want to talk about this very much, uh, but um, it's um, sort of an interesting piece of uh, what physics can maybe contribute uh, to this question of um, um, generation of, of informational polymers. Um, and, and so what the claim is here is that under certain conditions, you can have local environments that could be sources for not just a broad distribution of RNAs, but, a, but RNAs of a typical length. Yeah? And, and uh, what this length depends on is sort of uh, not just the property of the RNA itself, the chemistry, but also a property of this environment that the RNA is embedded in. So you could imagine that you have different local pots, local reaction volumes, maybe in, in pores in a rock or so, um, where, which could each generate sort of different typical length scales of RNA. Um, uh, yes? Uh, uh, Ulrich, may I have a quick question? Sure. Um, yeah, do you think that this uh, sharp peak is a, some sort of a, like a localization builds up? Uh, can you say briefly about this can be also characteristic lengths, uh, like uh, relating to character, character, how you say, um, characteristic mass or characteristic de uh, density or length? Sorry, <laughs> sorry, it's lousy. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Or just uh, like a qualitative description here. You, you mean sort of the, the um, absolute scale what, the, what could come out here? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean this, um, um, okay, so we actually also have a, an experiment for this um, and um, uh, this was done sort of um, uh, using a ligase enzyme. Yeah? So this was cheating a little bit just to speed up the time yeah? because uh, the, the, the problem with all of this chemistry is that the chemistry is so slow that the lifetime of a PhD student uh, can come short. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. okay, we drop there and then maybe later. Okay, yeah. thanks. But, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there's an experiment and, and um, uh, th that shows some actual real uh, molecules and a real peak uh, that emerges. But, but the message here is that the mechanism can in principle generate any uh, length scale. It just depends on the time scale. So. Yeah, yeah. So in particular, so this outflux rate here, um, is, is, as long as it's not too high, yeah, you can, uh, if it's too high, not, no peak will emerge at all. But if it's lower than um, at that threshold, uh, then you can move basically this peak uh, along the length. Yeah? But, but, but you could easily generate, let's say, uh, 50 mers or 100 mers or something like that. Yeah. Okay, okay. thanks. Okay. Hi, sorry, I had a question too. Um, so I was wondering if as the strand length increases, you've, you've got a greater propensity to have secondary structure forming. Uh, and I wonder, does that show any sort of not noticeable effect in this? For example, you see like, it looks like there's two exponents sort of um, on the curve, uh, you know, before and after the peak. And I was wondering, does that have anything to do with structure? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, uh, you could be right. I mean, longer pieces of uh, single-stranded RNA would, uh, depending on their sequence, typically fold into um, uh, secondary structures. Uh, so the only sort of structure formation process that's included in this particular model that we studied here is hybridization. Yeah? So, so here, so we basically ignore a secondary structure formation, assuming also that this would be in an environment where you have maybe um, temperature cycles or so, yeah, so that if there is secondary structure formation, it would melt open and then 
uh, as it reanneals and cools and they would hybridize. I mean, typically, uh, if there's a hybridization partner that matches well to an RNA strand, the hybridization is preferred over secondary structure formation, but there's a kinetic issue because at low concentrations, secondary structure formation could be faster than the... So, so you're completely right. Uh, so the secondary structure formation is an additional thing that process that should be um, studied in detail and, and the interplay here is just ignored. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the short answer. And the experiment that we have, and this was done in co collaboration with uh, Dieter Braun's group, uh, and, and the experiment was done by them, uh, that is also designed in such a way as to avoid the problem of uh, secondary structure formation. Yeah. So what is the R in, in this case, R out, you actually vary, the, this parameter is being varied, but uh, what is mm -hmm. the influx rate? Is influx. it set to one or what? Yeah, it's just uh, here. It's actually just a set one, and and then that fixes basically the volume and concentration units and so on. Yeah. I see. So, so, that, so yeah, that, then, if if you take the this uh, flux ratio R in and R out, that is actually uh, basically uh, uh, we can estimate some energy scale associated with it. If it's like ten to the minus seven R out, then it's like two times two two point seven something like that two point three. So it's like a fifteen or sixteen kBT. So, so is this energy scale has uh, anything to do with uh, some sort of binding constant of this dimer or uh, I guess some th this number means something which has some uh, relation with some binding constant of this monomer or something like that. I guess this number has some meaning, no? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, 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 it does. Yeah. So the Rn actually is a zeroth order process. Yeah? So, um, so, so this means you just have an absolute flux uh, of molecules entering the volume, whereas R out is a first order process, yeah? So that the out flux is, um, is proportional to the amount that is in the volume. Mm -hmm. um, so this means that the ratio of uh, R out to R in or the other way around, basically fixes the total amount of material that is in the volume. Uh, on average. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. So that yeah. actually compared yeah. with the, some KD constant, dissociation constant from the, these two complex, no? You know, if it's the, the number is above the dissociation constant of monomer uh, to monomer, then actually it's actually uh, uh, more favorable to form a complex. But if the number is more, then they actually form uh, just a di I mean, just a monomer. It has to be in the monomer states. Um, yes, so, so exactly. So, so what matters here is, is, is the time scale uh, of hybridization and the two time scales, the on rate and the off rate. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so if the outflux rate basically is larger than those time scales, then you don't have any appreciable uh, hybridization and there will be no such effect. Yeah? I mean, this, this basically, this effect here hinges on the outflux uh, small enough. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so you need this hybridization, you need template uh, ligation or templated ligation also. Um, so, so for example, if uh, uh, the outflux rate is larger than any of these rates, then he would be in the, in the regime of yellow and green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so, uh, well, uh, yeah, thanks for your questions. Uh, excellent questions. Uh, I hope they're all addressed in, in, in a paper that uh, I think they're all hope addressed in, in a paper that should come out uh, in, in, very soon, yeah, uh, in, in FSRF X, yeah, so this is by two PhD, two PhD students, uh, Joachim Rosenberger and uh, Tobias Köppel. Um, okay, but um, what I would now sort of focus on uh, for the rest of the talk um, is really sort of what um, is depicted here in, in Niles and Paul's uh, um, review in, in the box B. Yeah? So um, let's say you have a polymerization process yeah, that, that can generate longer molecules. Um, now you could maybe accidentally uh, generate a sequence that is functional. That has some catalytic property and that catalytic property could maybe feed back onto the production of its own sequence. So it could do something. Yeah? It could uh, copy, uh, enhance uh, polymerization. It could uh, enhance uh, 
hydrolysis and a sequence depend just some function that may be useful that can provide a feedback onto the chemistry that is going on anyway. Now, if you have such a functional sequence, the first thing that you need to worry about is not to lose it again. Yeah, because this is sort of probably a very rare event, yeah, because the sequence space you have to re realize is huge. Uh, typical uh, sort of random, uh, typical sort of RNA molecules that have catalytic functions would be at least, let's say, uh, 35 or maybe 50 bases long. Yeah? And, um, uh, and then if you have four different letters to the power 50, yeah, that is uh, already quite a large number. Yeah? So the sequence space is incredibly huge. And, and you need to be able to, to maintain a discovery yeah? that is functional. Uh, because there are all these processes that that kill the molecules, that the molecule get lost by dilution, they get hydrolyzed, they get cut, and, and there's UV radiation and so on. Everything tries to destroy. Um, so ultimately you need to make copies. You need to make copies of those molecules. Um, and now let's talk about copying. Yeah? I mean, uh, there's a slight distinction between copying and replication. Yeah, so if you make a copy of an RNA molecule, that would mean you produce the complementary sequence. Um, uh, and if you make a copy of a copy, then you have replicated because then you have um, the original strand again. So there's basically three different scenarios that, that people talk about uh, for how RNA could replicate itself. Yeah? Um, so one is that you have kind of an, an enzyme like depicted here, uh, which is sort of similar in spirit to the modern day uh, kind of polymerases that we have. Um, however, that enzyme would have to be made out of an RNA molecule. So it would be an RNA polymerase ribozyme. Because uh, if it wouldn't be made out of RNA, then it would not be consistent the picture of the RNA world. Yeah? It needs to be self uh, uh, self contained. Yeah? Um, so that's one option. The, another option is that maybe in the beginning there there was no um, uh, enzyme and it just happened spontaneously. Yeah, and we'll talk about that more. And the third option that uh, is being studied, and and here I'm showing a picture from a very recent paper um, uh, by Philippe Gay uh, from France. Um, and so, so this is sort of that you have autocatalytic networks of, of molecules that sort of sustain uh, each other and, and themselves as a, as a group. Yeah? Um, so let me briefly uh, talk about um, um, the ribozyme catalyzed uh, uh, transcription of an active ribozyme, which is um, uh, the title here of a, a well-known paper from Phil Holger's group. Um, and so they actually um, discovered uh, RNA molecules uh, by uh, in vitro evolution and also additional sort of engineering of the sequence that can um, act as such a, an, an active uh, an, an RNA polymerase made out of RNA. Uh, so these molecules still have quite a few limitations. Yes, yeah? so, so they cannot currently copy themselves. Um, however, they are being improved uh, as we speak. Yeah? So there's a much newer version that works with triplets and so on. Yeah? So there's lots of interesting work going on. But for our uh, discussion here, what's important is that these are long molecules. Yeah? I mean, on the order of around 200 bases. Yeah? This is not something that would be generated sort of um, in a single step uh, just by chance. Uh, the, the likelihood for this is so incredibly low. Um, uh, and, and even if it, if it would be, uh, then as we said, that they cannot replicate themselves. Yeah? So, so the, the question still remains, how could you have a primitive, um, a primitive copying process that does not involve any sophisticated uh, kind of ribozymes uh, or other cat catalysts? Yeah? And so, uh, and also for these autocatalytic uh, networks, you also need longer sort of molecules typically. Yeah? So, so let's uh, focus here now on this process where you have 
template directed polymerization yeah so copying of a template strand so the upper strand here would be called the template strand and then you have sort of spontaneous assembly of a copy onto this template strand without any enzymes just by pure chemistry uh, because you, these nucleotides basically have been sort of chemically activated and then they can they can hybridize and bind here and then uh, spontaneously ligate without any enzyme uh, to the previous um, bases that have already uh, uh, polymerized here. Yeah? So this is something that does happen in the lab. Uh, I mean, if you can you can you can work on it. And uh, a number of uh, well-known chemists uh, have uh, I mean are working on this. Uh, uh, this, this includes uh, Clemens Richard, uh, Jack Sostak, um, and I Irene Chen, uh, for example, uh, uh, three well-known groups. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about work here from Irene Chen because we've uh, collaborated uh, with her and also um, uh, work uh, from Clemens Richard, uh, who we also collaborate with. Yeah? So uh, they uh, do experiments where they probe um, this non-enzymatic process um, of polymerization, uh, where you have a, a given template strand, and here you basically they always like to show the full chemical structure, yeah, which is also nice for us to appreciate here. Um, and the, the main question now is, um, can you actually generate an accurate copy, yeah, so that you don't lose the information that is stored in the in the in the polymer, yeah. So um, so for that they have done basically uh, very um, carefully designed sort of experiments that are very clean. You have a fixed template strand. You have sort of a beginning copy, which is called a primer, and this is just hybridized uh, to the template strand um, by mixing those strands together in a pure fashion, and then you throw in um, nucleotides. Uh, that are chemically activated and measure the rate of integration of these two nucleo of new uh, nucleotides or new bases uh, for different identities. Yeah? So if you choose the correct one, for example, so for RNA uh, across an A uh, nucleotide, a uh, ribonucleotide, you would need a U. Yeah? Um, and um, you can make, uh, measure the rate for the integration of U. And this will depend actually on the local sequence context. Yeah, this depends not only on the fact that there's a, an A across here, but it also depends on, uh, well, what is the last base pair that was um, already um, made and, and maybe also to some extent on the further base pairs upstream and so on. Yeah? Uh, and so this is the, the correct process, but then there's also a mistake process, an error process. And, and that is if you, for example, offer a nucleotide G, which is not supposed to bind, but it actually still does. Yeah? It still uh, integrates. Yeah? And there's an appreciable rate for wrong uh, ribonucleotides to integrate. Yeah? And uh, this was actually done not just for RNA. This was done for RNA and for DNA and for other sort of uh, chemical alternatives uh, of uh, informational polymers that are similar but different from RNA and DNA because we're not even sure that the first informational polymers were uh, RNA or DNA. Um, so let's, let's talk about the fidelity of copying. So conceptually, uh, maybe we can think about this in a, in a very simple scheme. Uh, and you may be familiar with this Michaelis Menten uh, scheme for for uh, binding and reaction, yeah. So Michaelis Menten always have you have sort of two partners, uh, two molecules that sort of bind to each other and form a complex. This will be the on rate. With the on rate, this happens, but the complex can also dissociate again with an off rate. Um, but then, when the complex has formed, it uh, it can react with a certain rate into a final product. Yeah? And so, if if Pj sort of denotes the partially polymerized uh, copy uh, of length j. Uh, and then you have, let's say, a correct nucleotide that is uh, arriving and binding. Then this, these two can react together to a correct, uh, correctly elongated product uh, with length uh, plus 1. Yeah? Um, and um, if uh, 
if they're wrong nucleotides come in, you have the same process, but you have a, a sort of incorrect product uh, with this right. Yeah? And um, now, uh, typically, it's assumed that the actual reaction rate here, once it's bound, is similar or the same for the correct or the incorrect one. Yeah? This is not precisely true, but it's because the but but still the um, uh, the actual reaction process is uh, done in the in the backbone of the molecule. Uh, yeah, so the sugar uh, phosphide uh, backbone basically needs to close. Uh, whereas uh, the difference between the correct and incorrect nucleotide that's sort of in the side chain in, in the in the base. Yeah, um, and uh, so I mean. Now let's look at the error ratio. Let's look at the fraction of errors that are uh, being made in this process. Yeah, that would be uh, defined as the ratio of the rate of incorrect uh, uh, elongation versus uh, the rate of correct elongation. Yeah? So if we just write this uh, using Michaelis Menten uh, scheme shown above, yeah, this would be uh, this ratio. Yeah? So you have this depends on the on rates and the off rates of the correct and uh, incorrect nucleotides and also on this elongation rate w. Yeah? Um, and uh, you can rewrite this um, in the following way where you uh, just um, uh, use the, equi uh, the equilibrium constants, equilibrium constants uh, for these binding reactions, which would um, be defined by the, by the off rate divided by the on rate of each process. And you have two different equilibrium constants. Um, and the ratio of these two equilibrium constants, they are what in physics is called the Boltzmann factor. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, basically uh, just um, uh, um, yeah, a weight uh, um, evolving the free energy difference uh, between uh, the correct and the incorrect sort of um, complex. Um, and so, so the error ratio involves uh, the uh, this basically thermodynamic property, this thermodynamic quantity, which is really just a pure um, energetic uh, or free energy kind of uh, discrimination, um, which is uh, equilibrium. Uh, but then there's also kinetic term, um, and this kinetic term uh, looks like this. Yeah? And and one can one can argue yeah, that on average. If you if you look at different combinations and different sequence contexts, yeah, that this kinetic term can only increase. Yeah? It can only increase the error ratio. It can never sort of decrease it. I mean, if the Ws would be different for certain bases, then it could, for some base combinations, increase it slightly. But then you would pay for this uh, with larger error rates in in other base combinations. Yeah, so there is sort of a, a thermodynamic limit on the error discrimination, which is basically um, uh, basically uh, contained in this Boltzmann factor. Yeah? So the first thing you would do as a physicist is see well look let's look at the actual data and let's compare it to this thermodynamic limit. Um, just to see where are we? Yeah? Are we close to it? Are we, uh, do we see the same trends as thermodynamics uh, suggests or not? And that's something um, that you can do um, at least uh, approximately by estimating the thermodynamics from, um, from uh, lots of measurements that have been done uh, by many people, but um, uh, for RNA, there's sort of a famous data set uh, that's curated by, by uh, Doug Turner. Uh, and then for DNA, you have uh, John Lanta, uh, Santa Lucia uh, Jr., who has assembled sort of uh, data sets. And these data sets basically they provide rules to calculate these free energy differences, uh, delta G. Yeah? Uh, and I don't want to sort of go into the details here so much. Uh, if you have questions, uh, I'm happy to talk about this uh, at the end. Um, but but you can estimate so sort of these delta Gs, yeah? and, and and we and we did that, um, and then compared basically um, the experimental error fractions uh, which are plotted here um, on the y-axis to this sort of theoretical thermodynamic estimate, yeah? just based on the stability on the delta G, and the different dots are basically for different. 
uh, error processes. So you have different uh, template sequences, you have different um, um, bases coming in and so on. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and if, if we accept that there is this thermodynamic limit, yeah, so that uh, this kinetic uh, factor can never be uh, less than one, uh, then there would be a forbidden region in this diagram. Yeah? And this is sort of uh, this um, purple uh, uh, triangle here. Um, and, and we see that the, the data points actually are above, so outside uh, of this forbidden region. And they are not quite at the boundary, but um, also not too far away either. And, this, and there's a certain correlation, at least, between the theoretically expected kind of um, thermodynamic uh, error ratios and the um, uh, and the experimentally observed ones. Yeah? Uh, although to, to actually predict each of these values is uh, currently uh, not not possible or not easily possible at least. And I know people are working on this, but um, uh, it's it's currently not not understood. Okay, so um, that's um, that's sort of a, a piece of a fact, huh? and. Uh, and, and you see that, that some of these error processes, they have quite a big error. Yeah? So that means uh, uh, 0 0.1 would mean 10% error. Yeah? Uh, and there's actually, for RNA, it's even worse. RNA uh, goes to about 20% uh, error uh, uh, because of this GU uh, wobble pair, base pair, which uh, has bad thermodynamic discrimination. Yeah? And so it's quite important to think about how fidelity can be improved beyond sort of this. Yeah? Um, and uh, I just want to briefly mention that, that um, there's sort of now a huge data set uh, for this uh, template directed uh, non um, enzymatic polymerization and, and copying um, that has a lot of uh, rates. Uh, um, and um, we, um, and this was done by, by Clemens Richard and, and Irene Chen together. Um, and um, so we, we, you, know, you, can, you can basically use, use this um, data set to extrapolate uh, uh, for the copying of longer sequences, but I don't really wanna talk about that so much. So what I want to talk about uh, is that the general observation from this, from all of this data, is that the copying fidelity is just too low. Yeah? Um, and what does it mean that copying fidelity is too low? Two things can happen. Um, the more elementary thing is that uh, you, you're not able to generate an accurate copy of a spontaneously emerged sort of functional a functional molecule before it's destroyed. I mean, that's sort of the minimum that you need in order to get evolution started is you need to have at least a replication process that can generate one functional copy of a template before the template is destroyed. And then sort of more elaborate uh, criteria are so-called Eigen's error threshold, for example, that assumes that you already have replication going on both for functional uh, uh, sequences and also for uh, mutated sequences, and then the functional sequence is competing with the replication of mutated sequences. And if the errors are too large, uh, the error ratio is too large, basically, then the mutants can outcompete the, uh, the functional uh, molecule even against selection. And that's sort of a, um, a much studied uh, phenomenon in evolution uh, called the error catastrophe, which is really a uh, a competition between replicators uh, of different um, fitnesses uh, and, uh, and mutation. Um, but I think for the context of prebiotic evolution, we first have to overcome a more elementary, more basic threshold. Yeah? Not even this eigen error threshold, uh, just make sure we have at least one functional copy before the template is destroyed. And that's what I want to focus on for the rest of this talk. Yeah? Like, um, now, how is fidelity um, kept high in modern biology? Yeah, so maybe you know about this. So it's a, it's a concept that uh, um, was uh, invented by Hopfield and, and Nino. Uh, and 
I think um, uh, Pierre Gaspar uh, also uh, mentioned this. Uh, so there's uh, the, uh, the, the concept of kinetic proofreading. Yeah? So uh, modern day sort of polymerases, what they can do um, uh, is um, that they basically, they catalyze the incorporation of sort of, so you have a template here and you have a, a, a partial copy and the polymerase molecule is, is sort of a, a processive enzyme that sits at this interface. Uh, and then it, it um, catalyzes the integration of new uh, monomers. And if, if they're correct, that's fine. But if they're incorrect, actually the, uh, the enzyme can walk back and take out the, um, uh, take out the, the incorrect nucleotide. Huh? And then uh, there's a chance that uh, so this will happen again, the polymerization process. And then next time, of course, you have again the thermodynamic discrimination between correct and incorrect nucleotides. So there's basically a squared uh, chance uh, of the th thermodynamic probability. So the thermodynamic probability gets basically squared uh, um, to integrate the correct um, the correct nucleotide. Uh, or actually, uh, to to be um, uh, more precise, is that the error. Uh, the resulting error basically is the square of the thermodynamic error for just a single integration. Okay, so this um, is this famous process of kinetic proofreading. The problem is this requires an enzyme. Yeah, it requires a, a polymerase with a so-called uh, um, uh, proofreading domain. Uh, and these are sort of very sophisticated enzymes, not something that just consists out of a few amino acids that randomly uh, are um, bonded together, but it's really super evolved uh, machine that just wasn't around yeah, in, uh, in early evolution. Yeah? So, um, so the, the big question I think, or one big question is, what fidelity can you achieve um, without such um, uh, highly evolved enzymes? And are there maybe sort of interesting kinetic non-equilibrium effects um, that can boost the fidelity without the enzymes. And uh, to that, uh, uh, to, um, with that uh, sort of uh, motivation, we want to look at an effect uh, that was uh, discovered by um, Irene Chen and Jack Sostek, um, uh, namely, if at least uh, this was actually discovered before uh, for uh, polymerases. This also exists for polymerases, but it was then discovered to be true also for this uh, template-directed um, polymerization uh, without enzymes, namely that um, the integration of a correct uh, nucleotide is not only more probable, but it's also faster. Yeah, so there, so the or the other way around. Basically, if you want to integrate a wrong nucleotide into a growing um, copy strand, basically the rate of doing this uh, can be um, can be twenty to one hundred fifty times, let's say, smaller, uh, so slower, depending on the sequence context and depending on the number of errors and so on. Yeah? So this has been measured uh, experimentally in, in in some detail. And what we did is basically uh, we integrated this into a kinetic model, a full kinetic model of this template-directed polymerization process. Yeah? So the numbers uh, that are shown here, they are sort of estimated from experiments. And I briefly want to mention them. Yeah? So, so what we have here is the error probability. Um, after, um, after an error has already been made. Yeah? So let's say you have integrated a wrong nucleotide. Uh, and then the question is now if you, um, I think I, I did not uh, st state this precisely enough. Yeah? So, uh, so what, what the stalling effect is, yeah? is that if you have integration of a correct nucleotide um, and, or incorrect nucleotide, th this doesn't matter so much. Yeah? It's, it's, it's more or less the same speed, just the probability is different. Yeah? But if you integrate uh, another nucleotide after an error has been made, that is slowed down uh, by a large factor. So this is called the stalling after a mismatch. Yeah? Um, and for this, there is a stalling factor, which says how much slower is the integration 
uh, of a nucleotide after an error than without an error. And for if you have one error, uh, then on average, it's about 25 times slower, um, both for RNA and DNA. Uh, if you have two errors already, then it's uh, about 125 on average slower, plus or minus, yeah, depending on the sequence. Uh, and if you have three or more uh, uh, errors, then integration of a correct nucleotide after that uh, is about 250 times slower. Yeah, and, and, and these are the probabilities. So if you have uh, no error, the, the probability to integrate uh, an uh, uh, incorrect nucleotide um, is, uh, is about on average 8% for DNA and about 17% for RNA. Uh, and of course, uh, the correct nucleotides are, are the remainder, what remains 200%. And this increases rapidly as you already have errors before. Yeah? So if there's basically already one error, then the chances to make another error increase very strongly. Yeah? So they go up to about uh, what is this, 60% or so, right? Um, and then it doesn't increase much further than if you have more, more errors, it doesn't really matter so much. Yeah? It just increases a little bit. Uh, hello? Yes, yes. Uh, I have a question, very simple one. So um, uh, this is stalling effect, so that uh, you can distinguish as kind of a fast versus a hundred times slower. Do you expect a, sort of a, that uh, the fast process is taking exponential decay but what about this 100 times slower uh, process can be taken something different uh, statistical distribution, for example, like a logarithmic distributions? Oh, I see. So you're asking about the- Yeah, because it's, a, it's, it's increasing the, along the axis. So I, I would expect more like a logarithmic uh, fashion of a statistical, uh, everything would be, um, uh, I think appropriate, but just a question, okay? Um, yeah, maybe yeah, 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 yeah. we can talk later. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so, I mean, very valid question, of course. As a theorist, you would like to see basically the full uh, distribution of um, the kinetics in a sense of integration, yeah? Uh, so basically the, the shape of the curve, uh, like the early events, uh, the, the, the probability to, to be integrated after finite time t, let's say, yeah? Mm -hmm. That's what you would love to be measured. Now, that's uh, not what we get from the experiments. Uh, because of these kinetics are so slow, it's the time scale is on the order of hour for a correct nucleotide. Yeah? And for incorrects, it can be then days, um, at least with the chemistry under the conditions that is typically available in the lab right now. Yeah? I mean, there could be uh, other conditions uh, where it's faster, but it's not known. Uh, and so what is measured is just the beginning. Yeah? So they, they measure basically the kinetics of accumulation of product um, mm -hmm. and then take the slope. Yeah? So basically you see, uh, you see in a sense, just the early events. Yeah? Okay. It's, it's about measurement. You see basically a linear increase of product and you take the slope. Um, and um, yeah, if there's such a tail or something that you mentioned, I think it would be seen only at very long times, which are not available experimentally. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. But it's, it's, not, it's not an exponential fit or something. It's really just a linear fit to the beginning, yeah? that, that where the rates come from. OK. Um, yeah. So this is sort of the, the uh, now a kinetic model for this process that involves this sort of uh, uh, stalling effect, which is uh, kind of. Um, uh potentially uh, could be quite relevant yeah and and we see this here uh if you use this model now to calculate uh something that um uh is shown here namely what we show here is the completion time and namely that that's basically so if you have a template of length let's say 20 20 is chosen here as an example um and then you ask how long does it take to make a complete copy regardless of um, what it is um, of, of that sequence? Yeah? So it, it turns out uh, the copying time to complete this depends strongly on the number of errors that has been made. Yeah? So if you basically, uh, uh, you look at all products and then you, um, 
you ask, uh, well, what is the, uh, for example, so, so you were asking about the statistics, yeah? So actually in the, in the theoretical model, yeah, we, we show this, 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 these statistics uh, uh, in, in, as a distribution. This is shown in the inset here. So we see probability density for completion after a finite time um, that's plotted on the x-axis. So if you have no errors, then it would be this uh, purple distribution here. Yeah? So this would be peaked at very early times uh, characteristic time scale that is basically uh, uh, the length of the template, which is 20 here, times the basic uh, integration time scale T0, which is one over the rate of extension for a correct uh, um, a nucleotide integration. Yeah? Uh, and due to the stalling effect, you see that the, uh, the times, the, uh, the completion times of, of longer of, of um, sorry, the completion times of copies that have errors, they are longer. Yeah? So you see here the distribution with one error, with two errors, three errors, and so on. And with four errors already, there's little overlap between uh, the zero error completion time distribution and, um, the, um, and the four error completion time distribution. What's shown in the main plot here are just the averages and the medians and so on of of these distributions as a function of number of errors. And you see basically there's a huge gap in this typical completion time between the correct ones, the correct copies, they are fast versus the really bad copies, uh, which are up here. Yeah? And you can, you can see also now that if you have a kinetic scenario where somehow you allow this chemistry to happen only for a finite time and then you interrupt the process. You interrupt the process at a time scale that ideally should be somewhere close to this uh, time scale of a perfect copy, um, which would be the, the, the peak here for this uh, purple distribution. Then you have a high chance that in the suit that you're looking at, you have only uh, completed molecules copies that have actually no errors yeah? uh, versus, I mean, there will be some uh, with uh, one or two and so on, but not so many. Uh, that's the, the main idea. Yeah? So that you can have no kinetic proofreading. Yeah? That, that is out of the um, option just because you don't have these sophisticated enzymes, but you could have kinetic effects uh, that improve the error rate over what is thermodynamically sort of usually uh, favored if you just let the process go to completion uh, to a complete equilibrium. Yeah? Um, and this is uh, what could be referred to as kinetic error discrimination. Now let's look at this in more detail. Yeah? So let's, uh, let's look at the um, average fraction of wrongly incorporated nucleotides only in the full length copies. Yeah? Um, and um, Oh, okay, so sorry, the, the x-axis is cut off here, but this is um, uh, this time here uh, on the logarithmic scale, and it will come uh, soon, uh, the, the x-axis. Uh, but we see here, basically, the, the simulation data are these uh, um, sort of circles, and they, um, they show that the, the fraction of errors that you have in your copies, basically, uh, is very high at large times, but then it decreases uh, at short times quite significantly. Yeah? This is sort of the full shape of the curve. And, and, the, and, the, and the solid line here is actually a very simple uh, toy model uh, that can be solved analytically um, uh, to describe at least sort of this behavior at small times. Yeah? And, and this is something that I briefly wanted to um, uh, to go um, through with you because this is sort of a more pedagogical lecture. So, um, so if you if you simplify the, the process such that uh, basically you just describe it by a single stalling factor, not differentiating, so not differentiating the sigma depending on how many errors have already been made. You just say, okay, if there's no error, there's no stalling, and if there's one or more errors, there's a certain stalling factor sigma. Yeah, and then uh, there's also the error probabilities are also simplified in this model, where basically epsilon zero would be the error 
probability after having a match yeah so uh, to extend basically a, a, a correct uh, a copy so far um, and uh, so that will be a lower error probability and epsilon one is the error probability after there's a mismatch but it doesn't matter how many mismatches it's just always epsilon one yeah? so there's just three parameters in this model which is the stalling factor the basic error rate epsilon zero and then the error rate after the preceding error yeah? and for this uh, so simple and k0 is just the basic extension rate that's the kinetics of the polymerization process um, so so this uh, this simple uh, um, uh, scenario uh, you can write down sort of uh, equations kinetic equations that are uh, in stochastic process theory called master equation um, and so there are two quantities that i briefly want to um, introduce here uh, because they are important for uh, making this um, model solvable. So the P M comma N, what that means is the probability to, to have polymerized M steps already. Yeah? So to have already M nucleotides in your copy strand. But in these M steps, there were made N mutations. Yeah? So, so N mistakes, little N mistakes. But the important thing is that none of those mutations were done in the last step. Yeah? That means you have basically at the end of uh, your copied strand, you have a match. And that means if it's uh, being extended, yeah, you get uh, the error probability epsilon zero. That means uh, it's being extended uh, from uh, uh, one shorter basically strand with n errors with no error with the probability one minus epsilon zero. Yeah? And if you have had a previous error, uh, the quantity Q actually is the same probability. The only difference is that here, uh, one of the mutations was actually in the last step. Yeah? So that you're facing an interface where there is a mismatch and now you're trying to polymerize further. Uh, uh, polymerize further. And, and there you have the error um, fraction one minus, um, no, you have uh, the, uh, the Epsilon one is the error probability and you have the stalling process. So this is the sigma that sort of slows down the, uh, the rate of integration. Yeah, so, so and uh, these are sort of just um, very standard um, kinetic equations. And the nice thing is in this sort of uh, approximation, um, it's quite easy to solve this uh, analytically um, using sort of um, uh, uh, hypergeometric functions. Um, uh, and um, uh, so this, uh, you can actually find this online uh, uh, in a bioarchive paper that we just recently posted. It's still on the, on the review, but um, it's available. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, point out that there, unfortunately we discovered yesterday that there are a couple uh, 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 misprints, a couple typos in the equations. They will be corrected soon. Here we have the correct equations. So, um, so let's let's look at that. So these these continuous lines basically here, uh, they are what emerges from this simple analytical model. Uh, and what's um, interesting here is in particular that there is um, a threshold, uh, like a minimum uh, error fraction that you can never beat. Yeah. So even at very uh, short times, I mean the 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 error fraction gets reduced. But it doesn't go to zero. Yeah? So you can, of course, ask what does it depend on the finite error fraction, and this can all be worked out in detail easily uh, using this analytical um, uh, equation. But what I want to focus on here is something that's conceptually uh, more important, uh, namely the fact that as the error rate improves, so it goes down, fidelity goes up, uh, the yield goes down. What's the yield? The yield is defined here as the fraction of templates for which copying has completed. Yeah? So you basically, you consider a, a reaction uh, going on in bulk with many, many uh, sort of uh, molecules in parallel. And um, the problem is that if you stop, if you cut, uh, if you cut off the polymerization process, yeah, and this experimentally, I mean, you would just, have a change in the environment. Yeah? For example, if you heat up the sample, if the environment heats up, I mean, then it would stop uh, the template-directed polymerization process because the hybridization uh, 
is temperature dependent and they would unbind at high temperature. It also depends on pH, on soil concentration. So it's easy to imagine a change in the environment where this polymerization process is just interrupted. Huh? The problem is that if it gets interrupted at very early times, basically you have no product. Yeah? I mean, this goes exponentially down um, at uh, very short times uh, where unfortunately at those short times you have the good error rates, you have the good fidelity, but you have very, very bad yield. Yeah? Basically like almost 0% uh, is left. Yeah? Um, now, uh, so there's a dilemma here, uh, which could be called the fidelity yield dilemma. Yeah. So, so as the cutting time is varied, uh, the fidelity sort of goes up as you increase it, uh, as you decrease the uh, time, but the yield goes down. Um, and, and the big question then is, how can you get around this problem um, uh, that you could still get a finite amount of molecules that, that are correct? Huh? And uh, so there, it's important to um, be sort of uh, more explicit about the environment. Yeah? So we said basically we have an environment that varies and where you uh, basically vary between conditions, for example, a cold temperature where polymerization is possible, but then intermittently you would have uh, higher temperatures where uh, polymerization is no longer possible. Yeah? And let's say you have uh, non-equilibrium environments that, that cyclically vary, go up and down uh, like this. Yeah? Uh, and this can arise naturally, for example, in, in these um, sort of little pores and rocks and, and, and you have perhaps hydrothermal vents or so. So Dieter Braun, Dieter Braun uh, does uh, in his lab, they do uh, very nice experiments uh, that simulate this experimentally in a well-controlled um, uh, environment. Yeah? Uh, so, so you have natural cycles where this sort of temperature is varied and also molecules get accumulated and so on. Um, and so we can we can imagine now a reaction volume uh, that is exposed to such um, periodic variations in the environment. Uh, and, um, and you have sort of always roughly the cycle going on that you have uh, uh, association between um, strands, they bind to each other, yeah, so hybridize, and then you could have a copying process. This all happens in the cold phase. Yeah? You either generate correct molecules or incorrect molecules. And then uh, this goes through this uh, cycle of sort of larger temperature. And also if it's in such a non-equilibrium environment, what has been shown experimentally is that uh, due to effects such as thermophoresis or other selection effects, um, typically uh, longer strands get retained much more likely than shorter strands. Yeah? So this is, comes to our advantage here because uh, the longer strands would be retained and the longer strands are the correct copies more likely, whereas the incorrect copies would be the shorter strands. Yeah? So. Um, Basically, we uh, now I'm going to show you just a couple of uh, plots that are generated with an explicit model that, that has these full cycles embedded and actually doesn't even uh, consider sort of this filtering out explicitly. It just focuses on the correct strands, yeah? assuming that over time the incorrect strands, because they're shorter, uh, I mean, not the correct strands, but it focuses on the full length uh, strand copies. And the, the shorter strands would be filtered out over time uh, just because of these loss processes. Uh, and we assume that uh, an environment, a chemical environment where there's lots of monomers, uh, then less short um, pulley uh, nucleotides, which can use, be used as sort of random primers that can start uh, the polymerization process. And then you have very few templates. So, uh, those templates will be these sort of uh, spontaneous, uh, um, spontaneously emerged sort of functional molecules in the soup that you want to copy. And um, there's an interesting effect here that I um, want to um, basically uh, point out with this slide, um, which is that um, the yield, uh, which we defined earlier, um, I mean, that of course goes down a lot, uh, 
the yield for one cycle as the cutting time, the cycle duration basically here is reduced. Yeah? However, what matters then in such a cyclic environment is what yield do you get over many cycles? Um, and you can, you can quantify that um, as a yield rate. Yeah? You just say, okay, what's the yield times uh, divided by the duration of the cycle times some natural time scale to make it dimensionless. Um, and uh, then that's basically the rate of generating um, um, full length products yeah? over a time scale of many, many temperature cycles here yeah? or other cycles. Yeah? And the, the interesting observation here is that as a function of the cycle duration, this actually shows a peak. Yeah? So this sort of at large cycle durations, this is low, then it goes up. And the different curves here actually for different concentrations of these, um, these uh, short strands here, the, the primers, uh, it's not so important. Yeah, let's just focus on the ones where the concentration is a little bit higher here. Yeah. Um, and uh, so what, what we see here is that there is a, is a clear peak in this curve um, at sort of intermediate values of uh, the cycle duration. And then only if it goes to a very short cycle duration, then we have the yield catastrophe again. Yeah, so that that basically uh, there's not enough material being generated. Um, but um, but there's this regime here where if you reduce the cycle duration, the, the time scale, uh, both the yield increases and the fidelity, as we know, uh, also increases. Yeah? So, so basically what we see here is there's a regime, error fraction goes down, yield goes up, up to some certain maximum. Yeah? And then it becomes, both of them, uh, then the yield becomes worse and the error rate increases, um, the error fraction decreases a bit further. So you could gain a bit more here, but at the expense of a lot of uh, loss of molecules. Yeah? And uh, since uh, kinetic proofreading, you may know, uh, actually is something that involves energy input. Yeah? That's something that's quite important. Uh, uh, actually, this mechan mechanism of kinetic proofreading by Hopfield and, and Ninio is really, from a physics perspective, uh, is uh, how to invest free energy in order to gain accuracy, uh, to beat, basically, thermodynamic um, uh, discrimination between uh, correct and incorrect um, uh, molecules. Yeah? So, uh, so there basically um, you have to pay energy to get uh, the return. And it's interesting to look at this mechanism that we have here. So this mechanism, we uh, term this a kinetic error filtering yeah, because you do not correct errors, but you filter out errors here yeah, in this scenario. Uh, so in, in what is the energy expense here? Well, the energy expense is that the nucleotides that are being integrated need to be sort of chemically activated. So they're chemically in a higher energy state. And if they uh, get washed out of the system, then basically as, as non-completed copies, yeah, so non-completed shorter strands are sort of waste strands, and they, they are lost material in the sense that uh, the chemical energy is wasted. Yeah? So you can see that the, the energy price that you're paying uh, also increases uh, a lot um, as um, the, the period of the cycle is decreased. But fortunately, sort of this is at a long plateau and only uh, uh, below this peak here, uh, uh, the energy input also um, increases a lot. Eh? But on the other hand, you can argue that for prebiotic conditions, that we consider here, it doesn't really matter. Yeah? Energy is not a constraint. Uh, energy is maybe a constraint for modern day organisms that compete in, in sort of in limiting environments. Yeah? But for these early processes, uh, energy is maybe less of a constraint. What's maybe more important is to look at now the final question that I want to address, um, the time scale of making an accurate copy. Yeah? So if you actually ask, how long does it take for the first fully accurate molecule with copy with no error to emerge? Yeah? So then you see that this, um, um, this uh, 
also def again depending on the concentration of the primer but what 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 is interesting there is a minimum yeah so that for intermediate cycle durations and this is actually relatively close to the a little bit below this yield maximum here um you find sort of the minimal copying time yeah and this is um um so this is sort of the this is the idea yeah let me just summarize basically so we have this kinetic error filtering process which um is sort of a prebiotic kind of substitute perhaps uh, for for the more sophisticated kinetic proofreading that you have nowadays uh, and and as we discussed all of this yeah so basically the idea is that a slower uh, polymerization products are filtered out uh, whereas the fast ones are the correct ones yeah? um, now let's um, uh, maybe skip this part but um, let's look at the this copying time that we just discussed yeah so basically what's the average time um, to generate the first accurate copy uh, this is now shown here different curves are for different lengths um, and now this time um, uh, should be compared to um, the lifetime of the molecule yeah, I mean, so we just said, so the big question is, can you make an accurate copy uh, before the molecule is destroyed? Yeah, so what is the actually the, the lifetime of a molecule? But th this is sort of dependent very strongly on the environmental conditions. Yeah, so what we did here is we uh, uh, used a sort of empirical um, relation that um, uh, sort of based on experimental measurements uh, tries to predict the lifetime against hybridization against um, hydrolysis of an RNA molecule um, and um, uh, doing and this depends on the temperature so it shows basically uh, experimental conditions uh, from a, a recent sort of experiment that actually does these temperature cycles with hybridization and dehybridization um, and calculated the lifetimes under those conditions as a function of length. Yeah? So you see basically the lifetime decreases a bit um, as a function of length. And this is just due to the fact that for longer molecules, you have more sites where it can be cut by hydrolysis. Yeah? Um, and the other curves that are shown here with the, the open symbols, they show basically the um, minimal, I mean, the uh, copying time that's the time required to, to make an accurate copy. And that increases strongly with length. Yeah, so note the exponential, sorry, the logarithmic um, y-axis here. Yeah, so this increases roughly exponentially with length, um, just because it's less probable for longer uh, templates to be uh, correctly copied. But the, but the important point is that uh, if you match here, if you look at where these curves intersect, yeah, so up to a length of around uh, 50, so depending on the, on the concentration of the primer, so for the green curves here, we are close to 60. Um, uh, we can generate, so it's, it's, it is, uh, we expect that um, the correct copy is generated before the molecule actually gets destroyed due to hydrolysis. So. And, and let me say that T0 here, this basic time scale, which is for the incorpora incorporation of a single nucleotide that is correct, was assumed to be an hour here, which is sort of uh, because these actual uh, these lifetimes here are in actual sort of um, times in, 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 in terms of hours here. So this would be, uh, let's say, uh, 10 to the four hours here under those conditions. Yeah. Um, OK. so. Um, so the, the message is that with such a non-equilibrium uh, mechanism that, that exploits the kinetic stalling effect, you could actually hope to produce uh, correct copies of 50 mers within their lifetime. Yeah? Uh, and now I'm coming to the end of, of, of this and, and just want to, um, instead of a detailed summary, I just want to try to inspire you a little bit um, uh, by just saying that I mean, of course, we're interested here in a, in a, in a transition between chemistry and, and, and biology. And it's a transition that we think is sort of some emergent process where chemistry became biology. And notice none of this here actually involves physics. But 
uh, I think it's fair to say that physics, which sort of describes the environment and the interaction of uh, the molecules with the environment, and also sort of non-equilibrium effects, such as the ones that we discussed um, today, physics can be a catalyst yeah, for this transition of chemistry uh, to become biology. Yeah? So as physicists, we can ask basically, how can physics help chemistry become biology? Yeah? And I think there are lots of things to do here. This is, we are only at the very beginning of this field. I think it's an exciting sort of new research area for physicists to participate in. Um, of course, uh, uh, the, the problem is that sort of uh, the, um, we cannot get easily sort of historical data from how life really emerged on Earth like uh, uh, 3 billion, 4 billion years ago. Um, but uh, nowadays we can do targeted sort of uh, lab experiments and this is uh, what is being pushed a lot uh, currently by a sort of interdisciplinary community uh, to which uh, physics can I think contribute um, nicely uh, in collaboration with uh, the chemist and the biologist. Okay, let me um, thank the people who did the, worked uh, on these kinds of topics in my, my group. Yeah? Uh, and in particular, I would like to thank um, uh, Tobias Goeppel, yeah, who was uh, involved in both of the projects that I presented in some detail today, and uh, Benedikt Obermeier, who was involved also in the, in the, in the last project, um, and Joachim Rosenberger uh, in, in, the, in the first one. Um, and uh, so these collaborations are really essential for us. Yeah? So Dieter Brown's group uh, at LMU and Christoph Must, we uh, have a long uh, standing collaboration um, on sort of experimental uh, non-equilibrium processes, uh, molecular processes uh, um, in sort of interesting environments uh, with Irene Chen and Clemens Richard, um, both chemists, uh, uh, on, on this template directed um, polymerization without enzymes. Yeah, and these are sort of funding uh, um, initiatives that, that help uh, us do the research. And I would like to thank you for your attention and for the questions, the excellent questions that you already asked. And I'm hoping to uh, discuss more with you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. And then uh, we have already have some question in the chat box. Could you look at, I mean, uh, from the last one, uh, Papa Constantino uh, from IBS, he's asking some similarity between some nuclear physics and your <laughs> some optimal window, come off window or something like that. Yeah. Um, ah, here, yeah, I see. Okay. Uh, just a comment from a nuclear physicist watching with fascination. All this reminds me of nuclear reaction networks for the synthesis of chemical elements in stars and the all important gamma window, the optimal balance between the thermal distribution and reaction rates. Just to come. Yeah, so thanks a lot for that inspiring comment. And I, I, I completely agree. It's, it's nice to see sort of these uh, parallels between different fields. And actually, here in Munich, we have this. Um, um, so-called excellence cluster. This is sort of a funding initiative from the German Research Foundation, uh, which is called Origins. And this um, uh, is very broad and involves a lot of uh, particle and nuclear physicists who are thinking about exactly those kinds of questions that, that you mentioned here, um, namely sort of uh, uh, nuclear sort of uh, uh, synthesis, star formation, uh, really the origin of the universe. And uh, this, um, our sort of line of research is sort of just one line of research that is also contained in this, um, in this cluster, namely the emergence of living uh, processes or uh, uh, evolutionary, the emergence of evolution in molecules. Um, and uh, I think the the common denominator is really it's it's emergence. Yeah? So emergence is like you have more than just one ingredient. You have a couple of ingredients which interact in uh, kinetic non-equilibrium ways and generate something new. Yeah? And this happens all over, yeah? of course, 
even a lot of non-living systems. And the advantage of the non-living systems is that they usually can be understood in more detail. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot for that comment. And uh, actually, these comments reminds me of a little bit of this molecular chaperone. Here, the molecular chaperone actually uh, consume the ATP hydrolysis of free energy to basically generate some non-equilibrium environment such that they actually help this protein to fold, is a misfolding prone pro pro protein to fold the uh, you know, correct protein. Or it, it, this is also true for RNA chaperone. RNA can be mis um, uh, prone to misfold, but uh, RNA chaperone, which basically expand the energy, uh, help RNA to fold into the correct uh, three-dimensional uh, state. So it's a kind of very similar <laughs> idea. Yeah, I mean, potentially, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, this occurs a lot in modern day biology that energy is being burned and invested in order to beat thermodynamics in a sense, right? You, I mean, the, you have a certain probability for proteins or RNA molecules to, to do what they're supposed to do, but then more often than not, then you would like they don't do what they're supposed to do and then you have to nudge them a little bit uh, to improve this and and cells have become very um, sophisticated at coupling burning energy with correction processes yeah but but this is actually very difficult because it means it needs a direct coupling mechanism between the dissipation of free energy that is stored in atp for example um, or other um, molecules uh, and but this needs to be directly coupled to um, a molecular process that improves uh yeah so so if you have an atpas domain that is then coupled to a conformational transition in the in the protein complex which then for example uh does the proofreading mechanism or for the chaperone that you mentioned the molecular chaperones they have kind of these lids that open and close and uh, and do active degradation and so on it's something that's fascinating but what i'm thinking here is that we are sort of even i mean much before all that yeah, right, right, right. yeah. i mean there's a uh, lot of non I mean, there we have don't have those sophisticated machines and, and catalysis and so on we don't have atps domains and so on yeah? mm -hmm. so there physics has to jump in yeah or can jump in in principle yeah mm -hmm. uh, and and i hope that i think this is increasingly now being appreciated also in chemistry and i'm not a chemist by training yes i'm very ignorant yeah? mm -hmm. but i enjoy uh, working with the chemists and um and i think from they seem to be more and more open to sort of this i mean the systems chemistry sort of development is a fairly recent development this is uh, an extension of i mean the deviation from standard techniques in in chemistry where you just do sort of very isolated uh, ideal experiments to to look more at sort of systems and increasingly also environments yeah? and environments as soon as you go into a non-trivial environment which is not just a lab beaker that is well mixed and under constant conditions uh, then i think we're we're in the game as physicists yeah uh, because then we can look at the coupling of physical phenomena such as convection, thermophoresis, uh, electrophoresis, all kinds of these uh, um, physical transport processes. Um, and then uh, you have chemical reactions going on and the chemical reactions supply different time scales. And then uh, the environment also has intrinsic time scales. And then, I mean, if you're trained as, for example, as a non-equilibrium statistical physicist, I think you, you are in a perfect position yeah, to study those phenomena because you know exactly uh, how much interesting stuff can happen if you go away from equilibrium. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I think what's this is still at the beginning. Yeah? So this, um, uh, I think Dieter Braun's group, uh, honestly, I, I personally think has is doing a great job uh, of um, demonstrating, uh, like other groups as well, uh, um what what physics can contribute uh, there but but we are really at the beginning only so what's what's being studied also are cycles not just in temperature so also for example um uh, if you go move between phases yeah if you move between liquid and gas and then you have sort of the interface between liquid and gas uh, fascinating things can happen there 
Um, you can have uh, drying and wetting sort of phenomena, yeah, where you're sort of, yeah, so, so physical phase transitions can also couple to chemical reactions then. Uh, so uh, thanks for pointing out that uh, Dieter Brown is also working on thermal diffusion, right? So yes. I wonder uh, whether actually uh, in the experimental point of view, uh, the temperature difference between four primers uh, to go to uh, like in average sense, a successful copy. Is that something possible to measure like a millikelvin level or 10 millikelvin level? Um, the temperature kind of, between, uh, temperature, yeah, yeah, sort of a thermal diffusion. So of course it depends on the fixed concentration, but there's a, a tiny bit of a temperature difference actually will be built up. And uh, so ray coefficient, you probably know, uh, because yes, this yes, is yes. one is working on our, our colleague Sigmund Ligand. So uh, the theory actually, the thermal diffusion is uh, developed, uh, you know, uh, some people, uh, Roberto Piazza and also our group faculty and Don. Uh, so the thing is there must be some uh, delicate temperature difference when the primer goes to more ligated RNA, like a 200 base pairs, successful copy. Yeah? Oh, and then of course you can think about the unsuccessful, like uh, you know, a, little, a little bit of a failure of the copies. I wonder whether there must be some kind of a measure of a temperature difference. Um, okay, and first need to make sure that I understand exactly. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah. there's different kinds of temperature differences, right? I mean, one type of temperature difference would be imposed by the environment, for example, because on one mm -hmm. edge of your container you have boundary conditions. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I guess you are talking about temperature difference due to thermal, like exothermic reactions versus endothermic reactions, something like that, coupled. Uh, like where chemical reactions actually release uh, uh, energy and would heat up the, the solution. Yeah. That, that yeah. what you mean? Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, you're right, of course. Yeah. Exothermic reactions uh, um, would release uh, energy, uh, free energy, and then increase the temperature in principle. Yeah. How much is the, the resolution of the temperature? Yeah. 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 So, so that, that depends a lot, of course, on the concentration. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. if you have extremely high concentration and a strongly exothermic reaction, then that would heat up a lot. Yeah. The, uh, but we are assuming basically here pretty dilute. Yeah. So if so basically most most of the medium is solvent, yeah, it's water, uh, and and if you have just a little bit of uh, nucleotides in there and so on, yeah, and there's some um, ligation happening and release of uh, thermal energy from the ligation process, uh, I think. This is hardly measurable under the typical uh, experimental conditions, but uh, I think people who do very uh, careful colorimetry, uh, they, can, oh. they can actually they can they can do this, yeah. But but I don't know what the numbers are, yeah. So so I think um, yeah, I, I think it's very small under uh, typical conditions. So I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other question? Uh, I have maybe one last question. So this temperature cycle idea is, uh, uh, you know, kind of very interesting. Actually, I think it's not uh, totally uh, unreasonable because, uh, uh, you know, day and night temperature changes, right? Every 24 hours, you have uh, some sort of cycle. So I was uh, uh, wondering what's the, let's say, you know, it uh, has to be some, these are cold and hot temperature should be actually somewhere in between the melting temperature of incorrect base pair and correct base pair, especially hot temperature. Cold maybe should be below the incorrect base pair melting temperature, but. Uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't need to be. It, 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 it just be a general base pairing. Yeah, so let's say the uh, cold should be such that base pairs are likely, no matter of correct or incorrect, uh, but the hot should be basically such that most, I mean, double strands typically separate. Yeah. So hot yeah, could yeah, be something so, so like you, know, uh, for, you. You want yeah. this incorrect base pair to be separated, right? Well, uh, even even correct ones, everything. Correct one is, yeah, you're fine. But uh, maybe there yeah. are some sort of optimal, you know, temperature, uh, hot temperature or cold temperature, the optimal uh, phrase. I mean, which depending on the melting temperature of uh, Base pyramid in, in terms of efficiency of this, uh, you know, discriminating correct and incorrect. 
Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so in our mechanism, we don't actually use that as discrimination. Yeah. 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 The temperature. I mean, that could be also thought of. Yeah. And I guess people have thought of that. Um, and uh, like that. But the, but the bigger problem is that hybridization energy also depends on length. Right. Length. I mean, oh, so, yeah. yeah. If you're so basically, you have in the beginning when you start to polymerize, mm -hmm. uh, the binding is very weak. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you have the, the, the template and then you have this partial sort of uh, uh, copy, which is just a few nucleotides. Mm -hmm. And no matter whether it's correct or incorrect, it will always unbind very quickly. Yeah? So then you have to sort of keep polymerizing. You have to overcome sort of this initial barrier uh, of polymerization, which comes from the fact that the short uh, strands, they unbind very quickly. Yeah, and that, that is regardless of whether they're correct or incorrect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, but, but I think uh, the way that typically we envisage to overcome this barrier is that in the surrounding, in the, in the reactor or in the environment, you have not only monomers, but you have sort of short pieces of, uh, mm -hmm. of yeah. Yeah. So, so then let's say if you have a trimer or uh, that a trimer and the trimer already matches um, the template at one position and that can bind and that a trimer can then be extended with a monomer or a dimer and so on. Yeah? And then, um, yeah, I mean, so so in, in the talk, I focused on this very, very idealized scenario where you have, where you integrate always one nucleotide at a time. Yeah? Of course, this can be generalized and um, yeah. uh, to, to integrating maybe sometimes a monomer, sometimes a dimer, sometimes a trimer and so on, right? It, 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 would, it would do the same. I mean, it would, it would, um, the same effect, yeah. So, so the so in our scenario, the temperature doesn't really have to be optimized yeah. so much. And I'm, I'm, I think in principle, I think you're right. It could be used to discriminate, mm -hmm. but it's a bit problematic because of the length, of the length dependence, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think we have a very, none, I mean. Uh, uh, really gave a very nice lecture and then I really appreciate very much appreciate it and then let's thank uh, uh, Uli again. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your attention as well. Yeah.